With over 12,000 cards available for players to choose from, the majority of which saw their initial debut in the anime, you might be inclined to believe that every card from the anime has received a physical print. But the truth is, there are still hundreds of cards from the anime that have never transitioned to the TCG or the OCG. It's almost as though they're being kept hidden. Are these cards simply too powerful to introduce to today's metagame? Today, we're uncovering the secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! The Grand Championship arc was one of the Yu-Gi-Oh! arcs of all time. The tournament hosted by Kaiba Corps featuring some of the best duelists from around the world, but somehow featuring some of the most lackluster duels of all time. That being said, I've got a hard spot for this arc because it features one of my favorite anime exclusive decks, that being Grandpa's Ancient Dragon deck, which we covered in the retroactive pilot episode for this series. And it also features my absolute favorite scene of the entire series with Kaiba's final turn against Siegfried. We've got just over 30 cards to cover from this arc, so let's see what the world's best duelists have to offer. Starting with Grandpa's only other exclusive card outside of his Ancient Dragon deck, which I could have covered in that video as I didn't foresee this becoming a series on the channel, the Legendary Gambler, a continuous trap card whose effect activates when your opponent rolls a six-sided die to activate a card or effect. You can roll a six-sided die and if your die result is higher than your opponent's, negate your opponent's card effect. I do like the premise of this card, but the requirement of your opponent rolling a die before you can do anything makes this card unfathomably bad. No one plays gamble cards, so I'm gonna have to fold on this one. But Joey Wheeler never folds, no matter how terribly his cards match up with his opponents, and two of his three cards match up perfectly against Grandpa's Legendary Gambler. The first and overall best is Roll of Fate, a normal spell card that lets you draw cards equal to the result of a single die roll. Yikes. Worst case scenario, it's an upstart, which is already good. In the best case scenario, your opponent will probably get DQ'd for throwing fists after you draw six. Star Blaster, which I believe is getting a monster counterpart in Rush Duel, was originally a normal spell card with an effect that targets one face-up monster you control and rolls a six-sided die. Increase the level of the selected monster by the die result, then you contribute the selected monster to special summon one monster from your hand with an equal level. Sometimes you read a card effect and think to yourself, yeah, that would only ever be possible in the anime, and Star Blaster is the epitome of that. Under no circumstances in any deck could you consistently make this card work as it's completely random. And the most conceivable way of making this happen is by controlling a level 1 monster and having monsters of all levels 2 through 7 in your hand. Name me a single deck that actually has that span of levels. Awfully quiet. And Joey's last card is Hyper Refresh, a quick play spell card which can only be activated if the combined attack of your opponent's face up monsters is higher than your life points while you control no monsters double your life points. It's definitely a Joey card, a last ditch effort to survive one more turn in which you somehow pull a victory out of that extra life, but once again that only happens in the anime plotline. In real life, while it's not a bad card, your life points against your opponent's combined attack strength would need to be at a major deficit while still in your favor, so that doubling your life points puts you over the damage your opponent can deal as opposed to doubling your life points to still get OTK'd. Unlike every other video in which he's been featured, Yugi actually only has one exclusive card from this arc. But in typical Yugi fashion, it's exactly Dark Magician support. Dark Magic Retribution, a normal trap card which can only be activated when an opponent's monster declares an attack. Special summon one spellcaster type monster from your graveyard that was destroyed the previous turn and battle with that opponent's monster. Destroy it at the end of the battle phase. Aside from Dark Magicians pretending to be an archetype, I'm sure most other spellcaster focused decks would appreciate this card. I don't play any of these decks, but I can certainly make the assumption. It's good. And before we move on to more good cards, let's talk about some bad cards, courtesy of my least favorite duelist from the Duel Monsters era, Rebecca Hawkins. The Blonde Pest comes with three anime exclusives that are painfully boring and average at the very best. Ruby Dragon, which is just a reskin of Luster Dragon, is a level 4 Wind Dragon normal monster with 1600 attack and 1300 defense, so it's also worse than Luster Dragon. Not really sure why she couldn't just have Luster Dragon in her deck. Her other two cards pair together because why not? Adamantine Sword Revival, a quick play spell card that can be activated in response to a dragon type monster being special summoned from either player's graveyard. That special summon monster is tributed to special summon one diamond head dragon from your deck in face up attack position under the control of the controller of the special summoned dragon type monster. So if you fumble extremely hard and activate this when your opponent would summon to their field, you give them the head. So no head? Let's not be hasty, maybe Diamond Head Dragon is one of those monsters that are better given to your opponent. 
Diamond Head Dragon is a level 8 light dragon effect monster with 0 attack and 2800 defense. And this card cannot be normal summoned or set. It can only be special summoned with Adamantine Sword Revival. And this card's attack becomes equal to the attack of the dragon type monster tributed by Revival plus 1000. If I'm playing this card, I will give it to my opponent just to end the duel quicker. The best use that I could charitably give this pair of cards is sacking a low level monster just to put a level 8 on the field for an XCs or Synchro play, but I can assure you that there are far easier ways to accomplish that task. Let's get away from bad dragons and look at a good one from none other than Seto Kaiba. Clone Dragon, a level 4 light dragon effect monster with question mark attack and defense. And this monster can special summon itself from the hand when you summon a monster. When this card is special summoned in this way, its name, attack, and defense become the same as the summoned monsters. This card cannot declare an attack unless you pay 1000 life points. Last effect is completely irrelevant. It's an extra body on board for whatever you please, and the name copying sounds like a few specific decks could really benefit from a card like this, namely Blue Eyes and Cyber Dragons. How fitting. One card that didn't seem fitting for Kaiba, being that it features Axe Raider, a certified Joey Classic, is Flat Level 4, a normal trap card which can only be activated if a monster is destroyed by battle. Both players can special summon one Level 4 monster from their deck. Slimy, yet satisfying. And I'm sure there are cards that you can pair with a card like this to make it so your opponent can't summon a monster and you solely reap the benefits. Jaugen the Spiritualist comes to mind. And Seto Kaiba's final exclusive from this arc has an insane amount of potential in the modern metagame and would be a top pick for me to be imported to TCG land. Card Guard, a quick play spell card which holds a discard cost. This turn, monsters you control cannot be destroyed by battle or card effects. Not much else you can say other than this is pretty great, it's exactly what you want in a protection card. Going into this arc, I was reminded of how rusty my knowledge was because I thought we'd received all of Leon's fairy tale cards and all but one or maybe two of Z Siegfried's Valkyrie deck. I was wrong, and then I was wrong again. Let's tell the story of Leon's lost children's books. Once upon a time, there was a little man named Tom Thumb, a level 1 earth spellcaster normal monster with 100 attack and defense, who liked to take naps in bird's nests. One day, a giant wizard took Tom Thumb out of a nest, and instead of putting him in his mouth, the wizard put him through one day of giant's training, a normal spell card which has you tribute one Tom Thumb you control that has been face up on the field for at least one turn to special summon one Globber Man from your hand, deck, or graveyard. And in that one day, Tom Thumb would transform into the legendary Globber Man, a level 8 earth warrior effect monster with 2600 attack and 2000 defense. And this monster cannot be normal summoned or set, this card can only be special summoned with giants training. And Globber Man would go on to become yet another really bad ritual-esque monster from the anime that not a single soul would care to see imported to the TCG. The end. Next is a tale as old as time, the story of Little Red Riding Hood, a level 3 earth fairy effect monster with 800 attack and 1200 defense, and when this card is destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard, you can special summon one level 4 or lower warrior type monster from your deck. Little Red Riding Hood's grandfather was a renowned hunter of the village that he and Little Red resided in. Known as the Forest Hunter, a level 3 earth warrior effect monster with 1200 attack and 800 defense. And when this card is normal or special summoned, you can select one face up beast or beast warrior type monster on the field and remove it from play. No furries are safe from his mighty bow, however there was one forest creature that always eluded the village's greatest archer, a cunning beast known as Forest Wolf, a level 3 earth beast effect monster with 1800 attack and 300 defense, and it dons the disguises of the victims it destroys by equipping those monsters to itself. Little Red's grandfather once had no ill will against the wolf, hunting peacefully for his village and tending to his farm where he raised seven kid goats, a level 3 earth beast effect monster with 700 attack and defense, and when this card is summoned, you can destroy one face up beast type monster your opponent controls and inflict damage to your opponent equal to the attack of the destroyed monster. The goats were cornered by the deadly forest wolf while forest hunter was away on his daily hunt and every last one was eaten. But legend tells that the forest hunter will one day best the forest wolf, and on that fateful day the monsters defeated by the wolf will emerge from its stomach and return to their home safe. On that day, everyone will truly live happily ever after.
And my last tale for this week is the legend of the Princess of Thorns. There was once a magical spinning wheel spindle, a normal spell card that destroys one monster your opponent controls. The destroyed monster is special summoned from the graveyard in face-up attack position after three turns. The magic spindle was crafted by an evil witch, and that witch used the spindle to create yarn with magic powers that she would trick villagers into taking. There was a poor girl in the village that the witch tricked into taking a magic thorn blanket. The poor girl had no home in the village, sleeping on the streets, so she was quick to accept the blanket to keep warm during the cold nights. She laid rest the first night with a magic thorn blanket and fell into a 100 year dormancy, the Curse of Thorns, a continuous spell card which selects one face up monster in your opponent's graveyard and negates its effects. When that monster is removed from the graveyard, destroy this card. After 100 years, the girl awoke, but the blanket was gone nowhere to be found and not a single thorn left in its trace. The girl felt different and she was different. The blanket merged with her body and she had become the Thorn Princess, a level 4 earth spellcaster effect monster with 400 attack and 1200 defense and the magic thorn blanket gifted her the powers to take control of people. She fell into turmoil not knowing whether to use these powers for good or evil. She was never seen again after she awoke. Hopefully no one fell asleep with our unexpected bedtime story because we've made it to our final duelist in the Grand Championship arc, Siegfried von Schroeder. Let's begin with the Valkyrie cards that we're missing. Rainbow Bridge Bifrost, a normal spell card where you select one face-up Valkyrie monster you control and it gains 500 attack for each remove from play monster until the end phase. I don't recall Valkyries being a super banish heavy deck, but I've also never played them. That being said, even if they are, I'm sure there are better uses you could make of those banished monsters than a mediocre stat boost. But Swan Maiden is anything but mediocre, a normal spell card that special summons one Valkyrie monster from your hand. I could use all of my fingers and toes to name decks that would kill for an easy special summon like this. I could even bring along a friend to do the same thing. Good card. On the subjects of decks that would kill for support, Goddess Erda's Guidance is a normal spell card that allows you to set one trap card from your graveyard at the cost of discarding a spell. While not every deck could utilize something like this, in my recent playtesting trying to make the Pyramid of Light a tier 1 deck, this would come in clutch. The deck needs this card. Siegfried also had a handful of cards that specifically paired together for some interesting and ridiculous plays. The first two being his Nibelung cards. Nibelung's Ring is an equipped spell card which prevents the equipped monster from attacking, being tributed, changing its battle position, and activating its effects. During the equipped monster's controller's draw phase, its controller draws two cards instead of one for their normal draw. But if a monster card is drawn this way, they must discard one of them. So that's overall pretty good. The double draw for your opponent can be annoying at times, but not the end of the world. The biggest issue is that it's an equip spell, which aren't the most searchable thing. Or at least that would be the case for this card if not for Nibelung's Treasure, a normal spell card that allows you to activate one Nibelung's ring from your deck on your opponent's side of the field, equipping it to a monster they control. Then draw five cards. It's always funny to read effects like this from the anime because this could never exist in the physical game. It's as if draw effects were never powerful in the anime, and I can't really figure out why that seems to be the case. Nonetheless, don't hold your breath on seeing this card get printed. The next pair starts with Wotan's Judgment, a counter trap card that can only be activated when a monster is selected as an attack target. Switch the top card of your deck with a spell card in your hand, then shuffle your deck to negate the attack and end the battle phase. Yes, it's negate attack in essence, but that card swap is a pretty unique cost to associate with that effect. I like it. Fricka's Mediation, a normal trap card, requires you to remove from play one Wotan's Judgment from your graveyard. You take no battle damage this turn. Nowhere near as good as Judgment itself, as is the case with any card compared to Judgment in a different context. I'd much rather run Judgment only and forget about this card because it's completely dead in hand and on field until its target is in the graveyard. If you are so desperately in need of that specific protection, Waboku is still very much a thing. Siegfried has two remaining cards with no relation. Enchanted Sword No Thumb, an equipped spell card that increases the attack of the equipped monster by 400. When you equip this card, destroy and remove from play all face-up Dragon-type monsters your opponent controls. If the equipped monster battles a Dragon-type monster, destroy that monster at the start of the damage step without applying damage calculation. The effect is good, don't get me wrong, but like Hunter cards in Yu-Gi-Oh, it's too specific and format dependent to ever be a consideration, even as a side deck option. I think we have something loosely similar to this in the game already though. And Siegfried's final card, the final card of the Grand Championship arc, and the final card of this week's episode is Magical Elms. 
a continuous spell card, and when you activate this card, you gain 1,000 life points. During each player's turn, the turn player must predict how many spell cards they will activate for the rest of that turn. Then, both players gain 500 life points times the number of spell cards predicted. During each player's end phase, if the turn player activated less spell cards than they predicted, they take 1,000 damage times the number of spell cards they predicted. That's quite the party trick of a card. What else can you say? It's a gimmicky effect. However, this was also the card that allowed Kaiba to pull off his finishing move against Siegfried, my all-time favorite scene in the series, so I like it a lot. That's gonna wrap up this week's episode of The Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! We're nearly at the end of the Duel Monsters era. Let me know what cards you're excited to see. Drop a comment down below. If you liked the video, don't forget to drop a big thumbs up. It's greatly appreciated. As always, guys, and until next time, this has been Purple Pineapple TV, signing off.